It's Tuesday, April 23rd. I'm Adam Walsh, and this is The Signal. And it is the second and final preseason gardening show before the big May kickoff. Want to get things all set up for all systems grow? The show is for you. Michael Murray is here in studio and ready for your calls. That's right. It is a pre-season gardening day. What's the difference between a pre-season gardening day and a regular season gardening day? Michael, what is the difference? I don't even know if I know the difference. Sun's out today. Uh, snow's all gone. Uh, the nights are getting warmer, but still below zero. Uh, yeah, this is kind of the season when it's time to get ready. Yeah, well, you know, we're uh, we're stretching, we're limbering up, we're uh, getting everything ready for the big the big two zero. Two for a uh, gardening season. <laughs> so let me let me put out the numbers as as we're about to dip into things. So 709-722-7111, 1-800-563-8255. The text line is open, 709-327-8206, and uh, the signal at cbc.ca. And before we talk gardening, I just want to play, it's a 30-second little thing here. Curtis, if you want to give that a roll. Hi, Adam. It's Megan Gale Coles here. I've got some tickets for your listeners. Poverty Cove Theatre Company's Grace is this week. Grace follows the story of Eleanor, whose marriage is imploding at her best friend's wedding party. Written by yours truly comes a new play adapted from Lisa Morris' novella of the same name. Grace is equal parts, guts, and grit. Sometimes it is okay to be messy. Sometimes it's not. Playing April 25th to the 27th on the St. John's Arts and Culture Center main stage. You don't want to miss it. Thank you, uh, Megan, uh, Megan Gail Coles, uh, MGC, for that uh, for that call and that message. 25th, 26th, and 27th, so three shows. I'm getting three pairs of tickets dropped off here later today for listeners of The Signal. So the way we'll work it is, uh, I don't know, A, if, you, if you're phoning to talk about gardening today, we'll put your name in the draw. And uh, if, if you, you know, don't have your heads wrapped around the gardening season yet and you just email The Signal, uh, we'll put everyone's name in for a draw for today's show as well as uh, tomorrow's show. Um, and then we'll just give out the tickets. And so if you just want to email uh, the signal at cbc.ca for tickets. Sometimes you folks just like to put tickets in the subject line with nothing else. That too is acceptable. But also, if you want to phone and talk about gardening today, uh, just by doing what you normally do uh, during gardening uh, shows uh, and preseason gardening shows, you will be entered in for a a draw. So, Michael Murray, how was uh, how are things at Murray's? Busy. Yeah. Real busy. Yeah, yeah really, kind, really busy. Kind of like the ramp up, get get stuff together. Oh, yeah, type, we, you know. we've been really busy now for over a month, uh, and uh, a lot of a lot of stuff been growing. Was in a in our tomato greenhouse. We have a big house dedicated to hydroponic uh, tomato grown growth, and and they get filtered into the cafe and also to the sold to the public to the garden center. So two foot high tomato plants looking real good, all ready to go. Big house full of them yesterday. Delighted to be in there because it was so nice and warm. Mm. Uh, and we've been out as well, prepping ground. As a matter of fact, when I was leaving, Nazar, who works on the farm with us, was going up in the field with rototiller on the tractor, and he was preparing pieces of, uh, of ground for planting things now and getting ready to plant some things. Great time to plant spinach now. Uh, even seeding lettuce, hardy lettuce crops can be put in now. Uh, shortly, onion uh, starts can be put in now. So we're getting there. Some people I've talked to have in strategic places like sunny, dry areas up against the foundation of a house where there's there's probably some heat loss. People got to potatoes planted already. So in those strategic areas like that. Right on, yeah. So, heat loss for your potatoes. Yeah, yeah. So how, That's how, a good how, to, reca- on it. how to recapture <laughs> your wasted energy one more time as it goes out. No, no, don't insulate. Don't, no, don't, no. don't, don't pad the insulation on this side of the house with the sun. That's for the potatoes in the early spring. I thought it was an interesting, uh, an interesting garden concept. Oh, that's fantastic. What else have you been up to over the winter? Well, uh, one uh, the. Uh, 
always, always uh, a great moment for me. Uh, I don't know, they all make fun of me when I, when I get excited. But on the 21st of March, again, this year, with snow covering the ground, a plant that I value deeply is a native plant called witch hazel. Mm. And it came into full bloom as it should on March the th- on March 21st, first day of spring, this thing always blooms. Beautiful yellow flowers. And when that happens, I get excited. I, mm. can, I can feel spring coming. So that's exciting. Yeah. Um, other things that, that have been interesting uh, through is Susan, my wife, started a, uh, a, grow, a growing uh, uh, place in our greenhouse, which is attached. We have a little tiny greenhouse attached to the side of the house. And she started growing uh, radish seedlings and harvesting those for greens for salad and also some hardy lettuce varieties. And we, she put those in on the 2nd of February, mm-hmm. uh, which is an old traditional pagan planting date. Mm-hmm. I, I said, we got to do it on, on <laughs> February the 2nd. Candles must stay, Groundhog Day, embolic. They all make fun of me about my pagan ritualism, which I have yeah. a lot of fun with. Yeah. <laughs> I have fun with that. So on the 2nd, we plant them. By St. Patrick's Day, we were harvesting and have been continuously harvesting uh, lettuce and radishes. The radish is beautiful, nice peppery, mm. green and and soft. And, uh, and 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 the other thing that was interesting, she she was kind of heavy handed with the seeding, uh, and she was concerned about that. But as she harvested the first crop, then another bunch of seed germinated, and then that filled in, and again another bunch. So it's like a succession of of greens coming and germinating and flourishing. And then harvest, and then the cycle begins again. So it's been wonderful. I think that's going to be great. a wonderful annual thing for us now. Oh, yeah. No, anything like any extra bit of uh, like fresh whatever, right? Yeah. Like it is so nice to have. And yeah. then, then to have something that you're like, hey, this worked really well. We're learning from it, and this is something we can just yeah. continue to do. And then through those like the winter and the spring months, I mean, that's, yeah. that's so cool. That is. It's really uh, – that was exciting, fun. Uh, the other thing that, that I was interested in, uh, first time that I've ever planted scales of, of garlic, and I looked the other day, and they're all coming up beautifully. So I'm excited about that. So that's interesting to see. Uh, also interesting to see all, all the perennials now. Perennials are starting to show uh, all over the place in gardens, uh, hookeras, soldiers and sailors, Shasta daisies. Haven't seen hostas yet, but I know they're there. So you got to be careful when you're rooting around in gardens <laughs> mm, now. Mm. But this is a great time to divide and dig and transplant plants, perennials in particular. Great time now uh, to, if, you, if you're if you inclined to do this, is to harvest one foot high white spruces from wild situations, old gravel pits where succession is planted, uh, has taken place. And you can gather those up. I always like to see when you're transplanting, transplanting something, where do I want to place them? Yeah. Where in the garden uh, is the best place? Uh, am I, what am I using them for? Am I using for screen? Am I using them for privacy? Am I using them for an aesthetic component? So looking at the use of the plant, where I'm going to use it, and then transplanting, digging the hole, mm-hmm. having the soil prepped, and then going back to harvest the plants you're going to take and move them to the new location, the faster you get that done, the better your success. Mm. Worst thing you do is dig the plant out, not have the site prepared. The plant is sitting, like today, out in a drying wind, dries out the roots, and again, your success rate starts to diminish. So you want to be on top of transplanting, prep the site, select the plants you're going to move, and then move them quickly and do it in a matter of hours. Yeah. Prep the OR before you're going to do it. <laughs> right. It's like right. that. It's like that for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cause it, I've been thinking about that too, right? Because we moved into a new – my wife and I moved to a new spot late November. Not a great time of year to move, by the way, late November with Christmas coming up. Uh, so there's a learning lesson for, uh, uh, you know, future future me uh, in case we ever want to move. Right. I don't think we're going to. But, uh, yeah, we, we moved. And now we're, we're just kind of getting used to the place, right? So we're looking around. We've got some uh, – I noticed in the backyard this little patch of like little spring vines. Violets that are oh, wow. kind of up or whatever, yeah, which are yeah, nice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, next to a, 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 I think it is, I will call it a, a Charlie Brown esque rhododendron. Ah. 
Uh, so that that can tell you the the, the size and, and look of it. So I'm really rooting for it this year. Part of the pun uh, that it you know we'll see what happens as the grow season kind of starts. Yeah. Well, first thing is for that Charlie Brown rhododendron <laughs> is try to dig out around and get any competing grass around it away, right. so the plant doesn't compete with other plants. Yeah. Uh, Often when plants are planted, the excavation, the original excavation is minimal. Mm. It's hard work digging in the gravelly soil of Newfoundland. If you can dig out around the periphery to make that that root zone mm. or soil zone bigger, and I would suggest, you know, if you can get out a foot or 18 inches from yep. where the plant is now, go right around and, and dig out that material and put in more soil. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and the soil, just good, well-mixed soil, a little bit of peat, a little bit of sand, yep. uh, and, and then plant it back around. Uh, that will help tremendously for that plant to go from Charlie Brown to... Lucy. All right. Uh, that's something for me to be at. Now, let's just say in this uh, uh, example we're giving that that patch of violets is right next to it. Can I leave those alone? Sure. Or? Okay. After they're bloomed, if you think you want to move them to a more strategic place, yeah. prep the place that you're mm-hmm. going to move them. If they're in conflict, move them to another location. Sounds like you have bluebells or quills. Yeah, uh, you I know, think bluebells. They're bluebells. And so they, they're very adaptable. Yeah. Uh, you can move them, but hey, if, not the if the they're not the end of the world, don't don't worry about it. But the rest of yeah, all right, I'll, I'll get at that. Because like, I would like to see the roto kind of just yeah. you know, start to thrive a bit, because that would be nice in the backyard. Yeah. Right? Oh, it's a great plant. Have you checked out? The other thing I always like to say, where is the sun? Mm. The morning sun, where does it rise? Yeah. Where does it set? Mm. We're south, because in that plane, that's where the best sun's going to be. Mm. Identifying where shade is, when the shade occurs. Uh, is it midday? Is it late in the day? Because the site matters a lot to how the success of a planting goes. I believe rhododendrons flourish best when they're in full sun to half shade, but preferring full sun. The winters, the, rather, the, the springs are long and cold. The summer's short. Uh, the intensity of the sun, questionable sometimes. The back, where, where it is right now in the backyard, it's, uh, yes, it's closer to kind of the, this fence, but we're, so we're down in Kitty Vitty, the sun's kind of moved over now, rising up. So once you get into, once it gets above the fence height yep. in the morning, it, it, the path tends to stay over the backyard is Perfect. what it's looking like now. This is, so this is me just like looking at the pattern of the sun every day. Yeah. <laughs> just be yeah. like, okay, what do we got? Because I'm also thinking perhaps a raised bed or something. Like we're, yeah. Lots of thoughts for the, the backyard <laughs> yeah. for as we kind of slowly yeah. uh, adapt to it, adapt and it. figure st- some stuff yeah, out. Yeah, well, looking at the sun and, and understanding that relationship in the back. If you got a southern exposure, which it sounds like mm-hmm. you have, mm-hmm. your opportunities are a are mm-hmm. lot, lot more substantial than not. You know? Yeah, okay. All right. So, so that's good. I'm glad. We'll go from there. You are, folks, you're listening to The Signal. It is our pre-season gardening uh, show. Uh, the, the full every Tuesday regular season kicks off in May. But for this, uh, the second of two pre-season shows, the first one was uh, with Tim Walsh uh, from the Botanical Garden at uh, Memorial University. Uh, Tim was in back in March. And the point of that show was to give you all hope. And... <laughs> And I think it did because we got some messages from folks saying, thank you. We just know something of a grow season is around the corner. And today it, we're just uh, we're talking about really kind of getting down into some planning and uh, getting ready for the 2024 uh, gardening season because we are into it. Michael Murray of Murray's Garden Center, Portugal Cove, is here with me in the studio. Studio, If you want to join the conversation, 709-722-7111, 1-800-563-8255. Text us, 709-327. 8206 or emails the signal at cbc.ca what else should people be what should we what else should we be thinking about like i was looking through some stuff prepping for today right and it talks about like spring inspection hardscaping uh spring cleanup there's lots of different things that it from no matter where you are in north america or wherever else like that that's on the list like what what should people be well the first thing uh, you know uh, uh, this morning or yesterday i was out Pruning broken branches on one was a pyramidal uh, oak, big, tall pyramidal oak, had some broken branches from ice and snow loads, had a service berry, uh, an amelanchia with the same problem, pruning those out, Mm. then raking up the lawn. Mm. Good thorough raking, uh, getting all the stones and salt and stuff that gets thrown up by the snow plow plow during the winter, cleaning up those areas where you're having 
uh, the the remnants of the snow clearing activity on your lawn. Great thing to get that done now. Limestone application can happen now. Nice to use anywhere from 10 to 15 pounds of limestone per 100 square feet of lawn area. That would uh, be a great ap- uh, activity to get done now. Um, also, uh, last fall uh, with, uh, ro- with rhododendron, with uh, gooseberry and black currant, uh, I, I basically start layering some of those plants. And the process is just taking a branch on the outside of the shrub, scarifying the back of it with a knife just to open up a small wound, placing the branch down at ground level and contact with the soil. Then I put a rock on top of that to keep mm-hmm. it secured. And now I'm looking the spring now, I'm seeing the, the beginning of those plants starting to root in. When they come out in June in full, full uh, leaf, I'm going to cut off those layers that have, I've propagated, and I'm going to plant them. So I had three black currants. I think when I harvest these, I'll have, I'd suggest them around 10, 12 mm. viable plants that I'll expand my uh, black currant. Uh, oh, that's nice. My, yeah, those are free plants. <laughs> what you, free, free, free plants. Free. Uh, what do you do? So black currants. What do you do with them come harvest time? Well, then, then hopefully this year they'll they'll become established, yep. become vegetatively established. Uh, that's all I expect from this year. And then next year I'm hoping that they'll establish. Uh, the first bloom will take mm-hmm. place mm-hmm. and fruit next year. That's there my you. that's my goal. Do that with blue gooseberries and black currants, and I did a rhododendron like that as well. So. Those are plants that we can propagate very easily mm. right now. You can do that practice right now, as a matter of fact. Right. All right. Those are some uh, great, great tips. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, so you said limestone for lawns. What else should people be uh... – I, I wouldn't fertilize lawns yet. Yeah. Uh, as I, a great time now, as, I'm, as I said earlier, I, I see lots of perennials coming up now, this, this warmer weather. Great time to uh, dig up perennials that have become – uh, you know, too big for mm-hmm. the area. Mm-hmm. You can divide them. Sometimes you can divide as many four or five off of them. Shearing plants uh, between neighbors and things. The regret I always have, and, and it's like the plague that keeps coming back to you, I had two wonderful cultivars of of what Newfoundlanders call uh, soldiers and sailors. Miss Moonglow is a variety Beautiful, you know, military blue and red colors to them. Last a long time. One of the first things to bloom. My mother had some lovely cultivars. I took them from her garden and and brought them to mine. But I also brought the deadly goutweed with it. <gasps> and, and so <laughs> I've been I've been scolded several times uh, for introducing the, uh, the gout, the dreaded goutweed, into the garden. Mm. And I, I was out yesterday with my hoe. Uh, hoeing away and picking out. So this is a great time now to attack any of the persistent weeds, to get on top of them and intervene with either digging them out, getting the roots, putting a shade cloth or some way of blocking out the sun, or as it starts to come on and gets a good flush, you could use a pesticide, a herbicide like Roundup to uh, attack them. It's a little early for that. Uh, it, it, when I mention that home, they all get the shivers at mm. home whenever I mention the use of Roundup. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm scolded for that as well. <laughs> I have a secret bottle hidden away. Just yeah, they a breaking don't know. case of emergency. Yeah, yeah, did, yeah. Like, oh, you did some great getting rid of the gout. Yeah, yeah the I <laughs> worked real hard with my hoe on that one. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's all just elbow grease, folks. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a good time now to cultivate gardens. There's two rules of thought. And here in Newfoundland, I believe cultivating and turning the soil now is really important. Uh, there's this philosophy about no-till. Mm-hmm. Uh, here in Newfoundland, the soil is so clammy, uh, wet, doesn't dry out easy. Uh, as I said, Nasser today is turning soil using a, a mechanical rototiller. I'm going to have a look later because what's going to happen is going to fluff up the soil. Mm. He's going to get more ear worked in around it. Getting more ear means that there's less moisture. Yeah. Uh, with moisture out of the soil because of this tilling or forking through the soil, then it warms up faster. And so the faster you can warm up the soil, the better it is for starting off a crop in it. So mm. I'm, I'm a, a cultivator, plower, rototiller kind of guy, or uh, in small gardens, a digging fork just to turn over systematically going through and taking out the weeds. 
Hard work, but boy, it pays off big dividends if you're on top of it. We got a text, and uh, if you do want to text us, 709-327-8206. Email is thesignal at cbc.ca, number 709-722-7111, Michael Murray is with me for a the second of two preseason gardening shows. Adam, please ask Mr. Murray, how deep should I plant uh, seed potatoes? So that's from uh, Lewis and Ramia. I like to see them go down, uh, if you can, six to eight inches. Yeah. Uh, if you're going six uh, inches, uh, have enough soil around to hill them up so that as the stems start to grow, you're able to bury the bottom of the stem uh, uh, by hilling up is the old Newfoundland term for, for old, old potato patches or making lazy beds, as some people call them. <laughs> and, and, then, and then you're off to the races. But planting six to eight inches deep, it's a little early, unless, uh, as we were mentioning, the heat loss uh, factors in your, in your, in your uh, planting area. Uh, other than that, I, I would hold off putting potatoes in until at least the 24th of May, 1st of June. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're not even into May yet. And, you know, May snow is likely to come. and So it's, 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 it's patience. Mm. Uh, and you're better off, I think, waiting till 24th of May, 1st of June for those kinds of crops. But even crops like lettuce, uh, as I said, spinach seeding now would be great. Uh, and, and any of the members of the crucifer family going in around the 1st of June. Things like carrots. I, I always like to see carrots go in much later, like more like 1st of July, beets, mm. last of June, that kind of period. So don't let the enthusiasm make bad decisions by planting too early. See, you know what? And this is another thing that I blame social media for because I just know in my life, right, when uh, March turns into April and I'm looking at other places, so folks I follow who, uh, who I know, wherever, right, could be Ontario, Vancouver, uh, from <clears throat> Japan, South Korea, I, I just see enthusiasm around spring, and there's lots of stuff that's blossoming, and then it's like, oh, oh, and I, I've got that excitement here, and it's not it like ju I just need to not be excited as as excited. It just needs to be in its own like form that fits here. I right, I, I think the tad look right now. As I said yesterday, I'm cleaning up the lawn, doing mm -hmm. some pruning, getting some limestone down. In the greenhouses now, plastic's gone on greenhouses. We're, we're, folks, we're planting things now. But before that, about three weeks, four weeks ago, we were going through our usual sanitation rituals of washing all the greenhouse benches down, uh, using mild uh, javel uh, solutions, soap solutions, and uh, to, to basically wash down benches, growing mm. ears, containers. Sanitation is really important. If you, the higher the level of sanitation you have, the less problems you're going to have with fungal and and and, and insect and other mm. disease issues. So that sanitation issue, you know, scrubbing down, washing mm. down, spraying down. Uh, cleaning up and getting the sites ready now, that's what's really important yeah. in the greenhouse. Yeah, well, a fantastic message because I know um, a month or two, well, a couple months from now, right, we'll be sitting here doing a show just like this and we we'll yeah. get calls like, hey, I've got a fungus issue in yeah. my greenhouse. And yeah. It's like, well, how was, did you not Watch listen to the preseason <laughs> show? Did, did you not listen? <laughs> <laughs> I don't like to do that, but <laughs> <laughs> sanitation, uh, you know, uh, sanitation, weed control, uh, pest control, uh, these are all the elbow grease. These are pay dividends. If you put it in now, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll reap the reward later by not having to contend with those issues and going around and spraying and addressing things after the fact. Uh, we had a text yesterday from uh, Brian and Jane Yeager, friends of the show. They said it was an Earth Day show yesterday, uh, right? And uh, they said, Happy Earth Day. Another load of kelp going on the farm good. today to feed the soil. Good. Uh, which is, A, I love getting notes like this. And they had a picture of uh, all the kelp. Talk to me a bit about, because uh, we're talking about like feeding soil, getting ready yeah. for the grow season. Where does kelp play in with all of this? Oh, kelp's wonderful. I think kelp's one of the nicest, or easiest, cheap. You gotta free. Go free. 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 You got, but you got to put in the elbow grease. Yeah. You got to go out in the beaches. You got to pick it up. Uh, you, I've seen you can take kelp and plow it right in and incorporate it right away back into the soil. 
uh, or you can compost it if you get it in the fall, compost it. But right now, plowing that in, getting that worked into the soil, getting compost worked in the soil, turning the compost bin uh, are great uh, pre-garden uh, activities you can do. The frost is out of the ground now. So, uh, yeah, kelp is a wonderful, wonderful nutrient. Uh, it's an old-fashioned nutrient that New Newfoundlanders have used for decades in, 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 in farming. So if you can get kelp in quantities like that, go for it, but get it incorporated in so it becomes part of the soil substrate. Mm. Yeah, I I love like the what I keep learning each year now doing the show and and have these conversations. It's just about some of the planning that's required. But if you do plan properly, like the, like you are setting yourself up for so much more success, right? Exactly. If you put it in now, this is the time to prep your whole garden situation in greenhouse in the garden uh, around the very shrubs and orchard plants. This is the time for pruning, uh, cleaning up, sanitation issues. I, I'll t I was telling you earlier about an interesting uh, thing. Uh, was down visiting Ross Travers uh, just after. Oh, is this the bat story? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, Susan, we, we planted. Uh, Susan's wonderful. She, she, uh, I tell you, we, we're meant for each other. Anyway, she says to me, after we had planted an orchard of uh, cherries and pears and uh, various apples and uh, and plums and things, and it's five years, and, but we've been feeding it and taking care of it. We're getting scanty blooms, scanty crop. She, of course, says, huh, some horticulturalists can't seem to even get enough <laughs> apples for an apple pie here. I don't know <laughs> what's going on. And I said, I think we're feeding them too much, and I think they're too vegetative. Anyway down to visit Ross, and if, as she says when I'm going down, she says, uh, now you ask Ross about, about that. And I said, okay. So I uh, get down with Ross, he says, oh yeah. He said, you, 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 wanna, you wanna beat them up with a bat, because he said, if you injure the phloem and, and, and the xylem, you will put stress on the plant, and if you stress them like that by breaking uh, the conductive tissue inside the bark, then that stress is going to result in the plant forced into bloom and be prolific about it. And this is where it's like, oh wait, so we're not speaking a metaphor, we're being literal. <laughs> Oh, Ross yeah. is saying, oh, yeah. take a baseball bat to well, your... Bat. He, yeah, he was talking about a stick. He's, oh, a stick. Okay. I, I went further with it. I, I, I said, uh, when this discussion was going on, <laughs> I asked uh, I asked for a uh, uh, a baseball bat. I asked for a Louisville, a Louisville slugger is what I wanted because I, I, that's the bat you're supposed to use. It, it really is, yeah. Yeah. So uh, at Christmas time, when I was asking about bats and having that conversation and then talking to Ross after Christmas, the... the, the the kids got me a little bat. This is not a Louisville slugger. This isn't going to cut the oh, cheese. Oh, the little, yeah, yeah I know. Yeah, 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 it's not going to cut the cheese. But anyway, about a month ago, got my Louisville slugger, got out and beat up all the trees. Uh, Sue was out with me and we said, hope no one sees us here. They're going to think we're off our rockers if we're <laughs> caught out here taking a baseball bat and beating up fruit trees in the orchard here. And uh, she said, there's no one looking, so carry on. And so it was funny because the, 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 uh, the tissue was juicy yeah. and alive and, you know, things were moving up from the soil through the plant. As I broke through the bark and, and started to crush the xylem and, and phloem uh, that is just inside the conductive tissue, you could see the green, mm -hmm. the green tissue inside there. And I knew I was hitting uh, at least 400 in, in terms of batting <laughs> average. And we will see for updates to see what happens later. <laughs> well, that's right. I'll tell you how the yeah. bat, how the how the uh, the batting practice went. Sure, you could charge people money for that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, but I think I'm frightened for my sanity if I'm caught at it. <laughs> and we got a follow up uh, just again from uh, from Michael Bennett emailing, just asking uh, again around like no till gardening. Yeah, just to sure like your thoughts around it. I, I, again, the, the the business of look no no till gardening or no uh, till farming, in in a place like Saskatchewan or Manitoba or Al Alberta, Ontario, where you know they're spring, mm -hmm. and and their problem I I in Western Canada is holding on to water. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you saw, but there was a great discussion taking place in Calgary between the agricultural community. And 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 uh, and and the public uh, about water use, yeah, and access to water use, 
Uh, it's funny, uh, out in Alberta, when the railroad was put through at the turn of the 20th century, and the railroad came out through the prairies and opened it up, uh, the Canadian uh, National Railroad, Pacific, the Canadian Pacific Railroad, they put in irrigation systems leading from the Bow and Elbow River to come out into the prairie to bring water out to encourage mm. uh, settlers to come and go farming out there. Mm. Though I thought it was interesting the foresight of those railroad builders to, you know, basically if you're going to if you're going to put a railroad out into barren, unpopulated land, mm. they've got to sustain themselves. So having a good irrigation system system put in in conjunction with the expansion of the railroad mean there was a place for settlers to come and then community could be built. Mm. How important was water yeah. and the railroad to open up Western Canada? So it's making me think of doing a whole separate show on uh, <laughs> railways and uh, anyways. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, out there, water is, is not a big, as big an issue. So yeah. you're not trying to get water out of the soil. You're trying to retain it mm. and keep mm. it. Mm. Uh, and that's why the snow is important out in Western Canada. If they don't good, get good snow cover, they're not going to have a very good uh, fruitful spring because it dries out so quickly and gets mm. hot. Here, not the same, yeah. you know, because the soils tend to be very heavy. Uh, and the soils hold moisture, and they keep it cool. Water doesn't heat up very quickly, but dry soil can. Getting that heat and drying out the soil, I'm a big proponent of turning the soil, tilling the soil here in Newfoundland, and I think no-till, mm, yeah, it's questionable in my mind. All right. Well, there's the answer on uh, no-till. Uh, <laughs> Michael Murray from Murray's Garden Center, Portugal Cove, is my guest today for this uh, second of two preseason gardening shows here on The Signal. The regular season will ramp up starting in uh, well, just a couple weeks in May, right? Mm. If you want to join the conversation, we'll go to the phones now. Uh, the number's to call, 709-722-7111. 563 The text line is open, 709-327-8206. Or emails, the signal at cbc.ca. And it can be any questions about getting your grow season going, uh, questions about what to be for planning, and even just updates on what you're planning to do this year. Because I do like to hear from folks, the, the, like the last couple of years with gardening season, just even updates around what you want to do or what you're doing or how things are working. It's, it's always great. It doesn't necessarily have to be a question, but questions are, are great as well. Uh, let's go to line one. John's on the line, calling from St. John's. Hi. Hi, how you doing, guys? Goodbye. What are you at? Yeah, not too much. Uh, joined today. I was going to ask you about, uh, I winterized parsnip, and uh, I turned down the leaves that was on top, and I left them in all winter. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, when should I cultivate them? Should I take them all up or eat them as I'm going, or what do I do with them, or, or how to, and how to preserve them, right? Okay. So, you kept, you got a crop of, of, uh, of parsnips in the ground. Yes. The tops are showing now. Yeah. So... You know, you got a couple of choices. Uh, here, here's what I suggest. Here's, this is a good time to start har harvesting those if you're going to, yeah. uh, and, uh, and and use them. But harvest them as you need them. You don't be in a panic to get them all out at once. You've got all of me uh, to make lots of stews and whatever dishes you make with parsnips. Yeah. Uh, and and the best place to keep them is in the ground until you're ready to use them in a recipe. So you're in good shape that way. The other thing you could contemplate is leaving uh, some of them in the ground uh, because what will happen is they'll start to produce a flower, and that flower then in turn will produce seed. Okay. And you can collect that seed and start using it again next year. So that's some choices. Uh, it depends how much you're interested in your horticultural uh, activities and growing and producing the seed, which is, you know, takes some time and patience. Uh, but having your own seed is a wonderful thing, and and it, it's it's great bragging rights if you're if you're a gardener. Gardeners love to brag about the biggest this and how I grew this and that. So that's an interesting thing. Keeping them in the ground till you're ready to harvest them. Have you dug any up to see what size they are? Yeah, I dug them up. Yeah, the um, size of a small vinegar bottle. Oh, geez, you got a good crop. Mm. You yeah, many of them. Yeah, quite a few, yeah. Oh, excellent. Well, now, you know, God, will you eat them all yourselves, friends? Uh, yeah, you I usually share with friends and that, right? Yeah. And the other thing, like they'll keep, they'll keep in, in a cellar. They'll keep in a fridge. Uh, you know, you can keep them right through the summer if you, if you uh, wanted to just keep the temperature around 35 degrees uh, and put them in a storage area. And, okay. and, then, and that's kind of post-harvest 
uh, getting them through through the uh, spring and summer if you want to keep them that way. Yeah, for, I was going to ask you before I go, uh, if you leave them in the ground, will they eventually rot or What'll uh, happen? eat them as you go? Like, you, 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 they, they, when the weather warms up, they're going to start to go to seed. They'll start to, that oh. top that's growing now, that is going to get really tall. Okay. And and it's then going to go to flower. It's going to be a flat white flower, and then the seed will be produced. And come the fall, you could you could uh, harvest that seed, dry it out, and and keep it for next year's crop if you're inclined to do that. Right, right, right. Okay. Otherwise, they're going to deteriorate and break down, and and then you're going to lose them because all of that stored nutrient in the root in in the parsnip root will then go into producing the top and the seed. Yeah, and when I take them off, should I wash them off? Because you don't peel parsnips, do you? I peel parsnips. Oh, you peel parsnips? Yeah, yeah, I peel parsnips. Okay, I just wash mine, right? Well, that's it. I each to their own. Some people with carrots and parsnips don't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Nutritional-wise, I think that the peel has something in them that that certainly is worthwhile not peeling it off. Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, uh, it, it's a question of taste. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Th- listen, uh, thank you very much, Carl. Where are you? Where are you? Where, 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 where are you? Lo- where's your garden located? Uh, in St. John's. In St. John's. Wow, you must be in a place where you got good deep soil to get carrots the size of that, uh, rather getting parsnips the size of that, and you got a good garden. Yeah, I, uh, I uh, brought in soil, right? I got the soil mixed with peat and bog and uh, kelp and all kinds of stuff. Right? So I've got a raised bed, yeah. and uh, it's, uh, I make seven beds out of it, right? Wow, there excellent. Go. excellent. Thanks, John. Good deep. Do you have, do you lime it? A good thing if you're going to use that again, you could li- lime it, lime it thoroughly, get it right down, because that helps uh, get good deep uh, carrots and parsnips when you've got a good rich soil. Okay. Good all enough, right. sir. Good luck. You sound like a good gardener. Yeah, thanks very much, guys. See you, buddy. <laughs> John there, come from St. John's. Let's go line two. Dick Whitaker's on the line. Hi. Hi, how are you? How, how am I, Michael? Hello, Dick. How are you, bud? <laughs> Not bad. Good. Um, uh, I was interested. You mentioned the Joseph's coat there going along. Which plant? Joseph's coat. Oh, Joseph's you know, coat. Co- coleus, yeah. Co- coleus. No, that, co- coleus, yeah. No, I was, I was talking about my mother's soldiers and sailors. Pulmonaria. That's what I'm Pulmonaria. Yeah, that's but what I'm... but Joseph's yeah. coat is an annual. Uh, well, I've also heard pulmonaria called the same thing. So. Ah, oh, <laughs> okay. So, all right. The, 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 yeah, soldiers and sailors. Anyway, I just want to let you know that I have, uh, you know, uh, about five different colors, Ooh. some of which probably came from your mother's area, or so on, or at least uh, Doreen. Well, Do- yes, Doreen was a, Doreen was a was a good gardener. I know that you did a lot with Doreen in in preparing and keeping those gardens up that she maintained, and yeah. and a broad broad variety of of plant material. I, I even thought there was, it's too bad, but there was such a, an array of beautiful perennials that she kept, and you you with her did a, a great job of making a great display there along that roadside. Yeah, oh yeah, that, well that's, that's it. Going in, you know, the entryway was was glorious at times. It was. But anyway, um, what I wanted to say to you is that uh, I have, you know, these varieties. Uh, some of them are planted in an area which is... Uh, higher and a little more shaded and yeah. so on. Yeah. Although they're showing their heads, they won't be out for another two weeks. But I've got in another area lower down and more exposed to the sun. Yeah. I have a pink one that's out in flower uh, now. So Right. So, you know, this is the thing. You you need to understand your garden area. Yep. As to what what you should do here and there. Yep. Uh, the other thing that I think people underrate, and you don't have to have everything beautifully, you know, wonderful soil for everything. Um, you know, uh, good for some sorts of things, but yep. um, we have heathers in various places. Yeah. And, heaths, and I have at least, well, two different varieties of heathers out now. Yeah. And, uh, you know, these are one of those um, uh, uh, plants that are, I think we don't know enough about them personally in the sense that uh, as to plant them to get uh, displays, because you can get the heather and flower for almost the whole summer, can't you not? Yes, you uh, I, I've had the opportunity to build a number of planting beds using both heaths and heathers, having spring, summer, 
uh, fall, a succession of bloom. Uh, having it, you don't have to have perfect soil. It can take a rough, oh. rough, rough, rocky soil. Prefers that really. It seems to thrive in yeah. in that kind of coarse soil because it drains so well. I, I've I've it's found the heather on banks on sloping areas really establishes well. And you're right. It's a great if you can bring together the various heats and heathers. Uh, I think I, on one particular planting, I had as many as 12, 13 different cultivars uh, that uh, just had that succession of bloom. It was quite a spectacular garden. God bless the people who hired us to do that, <laughs> give us that opportunity. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, uh, the question for you, though, I, uh, I have a privet that I got from you long, I spec from you a long time ago. Yeah. I let it grow. I didn't uh, prune it at all or so on. and. It's now about seven feet tall or something like that. Yeah, it has lots and lots of white, you know, white flowers on which the you know butterflies like. Oh yeah, like. yeah, mean, lovely so plant. It, yeah, <laughs> in my growing up, it was a hedge plant, not quite thought of that way. But anyway, yeah. But uh, and it had a lot of their berries on this uh, winter, which the robins that were hanging around really liked, and yep. some of the other birds as well. So yep. it has multiple benefits. Yep. But being ancient and so on, uh, um, you know, some of the branches are split. And uh, um, do you know if I cut that right down? Uh, I know it will come up again, but do you know if it will flower this year or not? Or would it I, I think, year? yeah, if, if it's gotten gangly and split up and it's gotten unruly and it needs to you be managed better, cutting it back to to anywhere from a third to a half would be a good practice. Yeah. Taking out any dead wood that you see there, which yeah. I know you can recognize, get it out of the way quickly, uh, cultivating yeah. a, around it. I doubt if you're going to get flowers this year. I think it'll be next year that you'll get flowers again. But bringing some yeah. order back into shrubs that become gangly and, and open like that and susceptible to, to damage from snow and ice, yeah, good yeah. practice to cut them back hard. Yeah. One of the other things, by the way, I've put in a plea for starlings. You know, everybody seems to like to hate the starlings, but if you watch them, they're working your lawns right now, yep. picking up a lot of the grubs and so forth yep. that are a problem, you know, yep. um, particularly the moth grubs and, yep. and so on. Yep. And, and the same thing with crows. I, I watched crows all winter work in the... You know, right in the dead of winter, once uh, if there was no snow, they would work the grass and see if they could find something. You know. Yeah, I agree. Uh, but they're they're kind of nature's way of cultivating and dealing with pest management issues. So, uh, yeah. yeah, no, there's no doubt. We've been observing uh, the the uh, various uh, the various birds that work around lawns and whatnot. And when you see them, like you've said, yeah. swooping down in mass on a lawn, there's something good going on. Mm. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Yep, and uh, well, they're probably fertilizing it as well. Yeah, they're, they're, it's it's work. <laughs> Dick, what you're talking about is what 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 we, you know. Many of us who garden and know is working with nature uh, is the best. There's the best policy because that's the renewal, the sustainability issues that uh, any of us who've had any uh, any any uh, experience with gardening know yeah. that that that's the rules of the road. Yeah. The, the other thing is this is the time to do as much as you can to get rid of the things you don't want. That's but, right. Because because they're obeying the commandments of the Lord. Go forth and multiply. <laughs> that's right. That, that's exactly it. And, 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 and that's right. Whatever you put in now, I mean, I, I, as I was tackling the, the, the gout weed yesterday in its, in its small <laughs> forms and digging down and getting the roots and gathering together and putting a bit and, and getting them out in the garbage. I mean, around, around our place, once you see that, I mean, you, you got to get rid of it because it's the plague that comes back. Oh, to yeah. embarrass you later. Yeah, but unfortunately, we don't have uh, Ray Guy's uh, pies and eels to take care of them. <laughs> 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 anyway, I, I was exposing my my age, I think. <laughs> oh, that's oh, okay. You, any, you, any Ray Guy quote on the show is amazing. Yeah, Thank yeah, you very yeah. much. You're yeah. on the right. To, you're on the right level there, brother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Take care. Take everybody. care, Dick. Good to hear Thanks, from Dick. you. Bye bye. Dick would hear there give uh, us a Dick call. Dick is a fine gardener, and he's been gardening. Uh, when I was a child, uh, Dick came to Newfoundland back in the 50s uh, after serving in, uh, in the military in, in, Great, in Great Britain. He's, 
His half-sister, Doreen, married my uncle, Miles, and she was a war bride, but she had a, a knack in the two of them together. Uh, worked in the garden uh, in a property just next door to ours, mm. and uh, the gardens were spectacular. It was the first real introduction I saw of, of well-maintained gardens. Uh, he also created some garden pools that were interesting with frogs. As a little seven, six-year-old boy, it was like a wonderland, yeah. and... Uh, uh, these experiences, I, I always ask myself, how did I end up uh, in, in the situation? Well, it's kind of in your blood, you know, mm. and, and it's part of your heritage, part of who you are, and you see it around you. I don't think at the time that those influences are going on, it's really cognizant that they're having the impact they are. But, uh, Funny yeah. that when you, when you, like, think back, right, to, yeah. like, what, like, formed you and little moments that, you, like, at the time you're just like, oh, I like frogs. And, you're, like, later on in your life you're like, wait, wait a minute, like, there's more to all this. <laughs> yeah. Which is great. And uh, yeah, I'll say this about uh, Mr. Whitaker, right? Like uh, it, it, having him call on anything <laughs> environment, climate related, yeah. it is it is such a nice thing to get calls from him yeah. around uh, just having that, that, that conscience on, on, on climate and change. And, and experience. And experience. Yes, and the wealth of experience. Yeah. I interesting. Over the weekend, Saturday was such a beautiful day, gorgeous day, 13, 14 degrees. We're out uh, gardening uh, and, and just enjoying the outside. But something struck me about it, and I thought back to the, the, the depths of COVID uh, on similar days in spring when COVID first happened, and the sky was clear and blue, and there were no airplanes. There was mm -hmm. no flights. On this weekend, I sat back, and around 11, 12 o'clock in the day, uh, you saw the streaks, the vapors from the oh, jet yeah. traffic coming from Europe, coming here to get to directions to go to the rest of the continent. Uh, by the time we got to 2 o'clock in the afternoon, that bright blue clear sky was now getting hazy. And I start reading a little bit about how much emissions comes from a transatlantic jet mm -hmm. flying from Heathrow to Montreal. Mm. Huge, you know, huge amounts of, of tons of carbon released into the atmosphere. And I thought back again, we had an opportunity during COVID not to have that. Yeah. And the air was clear and clean. And that's one of the lovely things about Newfoundland is the quality of the air here is superb. Oh, I've no. Any time I've been away and, and come back home from whether it's living overseas or just or, or sometimes just trips or whatever, it like the air like th that that and there's always wind in it, but it's fresh and you. It, there is a difference. I find uh, it's one of the things that uh, one of the big selling points I find. Uh, for oh, air. It, clean air, clean water, uh, really, really uh, uh, important. Uh, the more that we understand that. I, the other phenomenon I saw is all of the hype and interest, and in, 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 in my own family even, we went to various parts to see the uh, the uh, eclipse mm. and, and a great phenomena. And, and, and at the same time, I was thinking to myself, you know, when spring comes and the leaves come on the deciduous trees and shrubs, that's even more spectacular to me because I can count on it. Mm. It is always there. Uh, it rarely isn't there. It's, when it isn't there, it's really depressing. Mm -hmm. uh, I always say, uh, but I, I'm only joking, best time to be in Newfoundland is when the leaves come on the trees. And when the leaves leave the trees, probably we should go too. <laughs> <laughs> I do enjoy, like, and, it, it, you know, it, it's approaching. But yeah. I'll, I'll go, so, like, Rennie's in St. So for, you know, Newfoundland Labrador show, but in St. John's, uh, Rennie's River Trail, right? Yeah. And so I'll run the trail system. Uh, I do it Gorgeous. fairly often. Yeah. And then the, that that little point of just, there's, like, one of the bridges over Rennie's River, yeah. and there's a point where everything is just kind of like the, the tips are green type of a thing. Yeah. And it is, gore like, it, it is just such a great feeling when you're you're looking, you're like, oh, we're there. Yeah. When you come down Robinson's Hill, George down by George V uh, uh, pitch there in that hollow, that's the first, and we're up Waterford Bridge Road, that's the first place you'll start to see spring come on because mm. they're little microclimates and they're gorgeous. Mm. You run up to the top of, uh, of Signal Hill on the same day mm. when that's just coming on. It's a completely different world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Different, different feel altogether. Yeah, yeah. I find right now, when we were talking before the show, uh, just with uh, you know, crocuses up 
that yeah. around everywhere. I, I need to plan for this next year for my lawn, but it is just such an enjoyable thing mm -hmm. right now to look around and just on a day, especially if, uh, so St. John's Metro, I'm looking at blue sky out there on the parkway. And if you're, uh, I know, so Labrador got uh, reacquainted with winter, I know, yeah. but uh, th that will change. Yeah. But anywhere where you get to, do, when you do get to see them, it is such a nice, I don't, just such a lovely little like, hey, it's We're uplifting. here, springs, springs here. And yeah. it doesn't have to be, yes, I was used to, for a bit, living overseas and a bit of the, the cherry <laughs> blossoms and stuff. So you could sit down on a tarp and like enjoy the, the blossoms coming down. Me on a tarp next to some crocus <laughs> is not the same type of a feel, of course, but it's still a lovely thing to witness. It is. Uh, as a matter of fact, we were just, uh, Brian Kowalski, who's my, my son, uh, Evan's partner, yeah. uh, he was up in the greenhouse just asking me to look at some roses and prune them with him. And, and, and he right away with enthusiasm. He said, the bees, we have honeybees on the property and, and we have several hives. I said, the bees are out today. It's, it's over uh, 12 degrees. They're flying. So what are they feeding on? Crocuses. All the crocuses. You see them down around the crocuses down in front of the store and all over the place. That's where they're getting, uh, getting some of the nutrient to keep them alive. So first thing is they all overwintered well because it, mm. it was a good overwintering winter because mm. we had good snow cover. Yeah. Um, but now that the, the good days are, are coming, I'm hoping to see more bees Around. Yes, and again, like those signs of the when yeah. the seasons change, especially coming into uh, the grow season, yeah. bees, crocuses, to bees, and you name it, it is yeah. great. Yeah. Uh, Michael Murray, thank you so much for the uh, the second uh, preseason show. The regular season starts in May. Thanks, man. Thank you. All right, folks, uh, that is it for today's show. Uh, Curtis, do you want to play that uh, that thing again? <laughs> well, use my technical terms. Curtis is like thing. It's Megan Gale Coles here. I've got some tickets for your listeners. Poverty Cove Theater Company's Grace is this week. Grace follows the story of Eleanor, whose marriage is imploding at her best friend's wedding party. Written by yours truly comes a new play adapted from Lisa Morris novella of the same name. Grace is equal parts, guts, and grit. Sometimes it is okay to be messy. Sometimes it's not. Playing April 25th to the 27th on the St. John's Arts and Culture Center main stage. You don't want to miss it. All right. And if you, uh, I, I, by the way, just got a note in from, uh, from upstairs. Hello, Adam. Someone delivered Arts and Culture Center tickets to you laid on your desk. So I have said tickets for the show update. If, you, if you're curious about these shows, uh, so that's a Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, I believe, of this week. Give us an email, and uh, we'll draw your name uh, to after tomorrow's show. So the signal at cbc.ca. Arts and Culture Center tickets uh, for that great uh, show. So thanks for that call, Megan. And uh, looking ahead to tomorrow, we're asking, what supports do communities need on big social issues? A conversation on what we know, on what we are learning, and what needs to be done. So think housing, think food insecurity, transportation, and more. That is tomorrow's show. Taking us out today. Did you hear the news? Friday, August 9th, Churchill Park Music Festival, the 2023 Canadian Music Hall of Fame recipients, and a diamond certified selling group, the one, the only, Nickelback. I'm going to bring you back to a 2001 right now, taking us out with, keep listening, with Remind Me. Never made it as a wise man. I couldn't cut it as a poor man stealing Tired of living like a blind man I'm sick of sight without a sense of feeling And this is how you remind me This is how you remind me of what I really am This is how you remind me
never made it as a wise man I couldn't cut it as a poor man stealing And this is how you remind me This is how you remind me This is how you remind me 